Thank you. <laughs> it's great to get applause before you even start, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I would like actually to start by saying that I'm very happy and honored to be a part of TED and do this talk today. So I actually would like to start to talk a little bit about confidence. Um, before that, um, I think that it's important that you understand my background a little bit because I have a disability from birth and everyone in here, our theories, our experience form our thoughts later in life. And my theories are based on my background with completely paralyzed arms since birth and about 30% strength, 30 strength in, my, in my legs. So I use, to move forward, I use a specially designed wheelchair with pedals that I invented myself 20 years ago. So I used this one everywhere, outdoors, indoors, by the swimming pools when I did that. I even did half a marathon on this one once. Yeah. <laughs> the stupidest thing I ever did, but <laughs> that's the sort of thing you realize halfway, isn't it? But uh, actually, when I tell people that, that I did a half a marathon, it, it sounds so great, doesn't it? I mean, you do it for, to show that everything is possible and never surrender and everything like that. But the only reason I did half a marathon was stupid New Year resolution, 4.30 in the morning, New Year's Eve. <laughs> so it wasn't actually, both me and my best friend, we forgot that I was disabled. <laughs> that was the only reason. It was late, 4.30, you know. Don't talk about disabilities or wheelchairs at 4.30 on New Year's Eve. <laughs> but um, I usually talk about that as well because I think that it's so important. That was sort of the main reason that I became a disabled athlete. I didn't become a disabled athlete and go into sports to become a world champion, a, do some Paralympics or world records. I did it to increase my independence. That was my only reason. Because a 10% muscle in increase for me is at least a 50% independent increase as well. So that's the main reason. And not even, then I don't even start talking about the confidence. And when I, w when I was actually starting in 76 to do disabled sports, no one knew about disabled sports. We just, just did it for ourselves. Today, I believe it's a bit different because everyone all over the world knows about the Paralympics today and what it is about, what, what we do. And um, today, actually, people even cheat to come into the Paralympics. Do you know that? <laughs> in Sydney 2000, the Spanish basketball team for intellectually disabled, half of the team faked it. <laughs> they didn't have an intellectual disability and they went into the games and won the gold. And I believe that that's actually quite cool. I don't like cheating, <laughs> but that is quite cool because what that shows is that it gives you more advantage to become good at something than it becomes a disadvantage to have a disability. And that is pretty interesting, isn't it? That we actually can change and become many different things and not only one thing. I believe that our identities can be formed out of a hundred different things where the disability is one of them. I am disabled from birth. But I'm a former athlete, I'm a lecturer, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a boyfriend, I'm an uncle, I'm a brother, and disabled. <laughs> and that's sort of, when you are aware of that, when you sort of accept your disabilities, it's a lot easier for you to enjoy your abilities. But if you always ignore your disabilities, regardless if it's real disabilities or not, it's very hard to enjoy what you can do. You always tend to focus on what you can't do. And the disability is a very visible example. I think it's a matter of integration, but sort of an inner integration where you integrate your different abilities into your personality instead of ignoring the ones you don't like. And when the inner integration is finished, then you can move on to an outer one. But you need to do that first. And that is confidence all about, because when I'm secure, it's what I can do. When I know what I can do, then I dare to try. I dare to fail. It doesn't matter. But if I'm worried, it's really hard. So actually, I believe that confidence is based on mainly four different things. Love, encouragement, support, and demand. If I get those key four key factors in my life, then I can achieve anything. But I need to know what I can or can't do as well. And I started very early trying to test my limits, to test my borders, to challenge them, to move on. So first, physically. Since I couldn't use my arms, I started using my mouth to everything, my feet. So I started writing with my mouth. I will show you how that works. Oh, thank you. Two major problems writing with my mouth. One, crayons. <laughs> they taste like <laughs> shit. Uh, and the other one, actually, pens like this. They are really strong. I get dizzy off the terminus. <laughs> um, like that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 
crease on it, handwriting. Or I'll do a special one. <laughs> ah, like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got a top grade in art class. No, I didn't. <laughs> I used my disability to get a top grade in art class. Um, and this is sort of where it gets interesting as well, because when I write my name, everyone is applauding. And I'm 35. <laughs> I, you, you see what I mean? And that's really interesting, because I could probably spell my name wrong and you would still applaud, <laughs> right? And I believe that that's the right thing to do. You give encouragement based on my abilities and not on everyone else. Even if everyone in here can write their own name, you sort of realize that I do it out of my own perspective with my abilities and I've trained to do it. So I get a get encouragement for everything that I do that I've been training to do. Imagine what would happen if everyone in the world would get that possibility to get encouragement out of what they actually do instead of only comparing them to everyone else in the world every day. No one will become good if you always be, are being compared to someone who's better. So it has to be individual. It's extremely important that you get encouragement out of your own abilities. When I went to school, we had a person who was dyslectic in my class. She had a big problem reading. She was always the worst, and I was always fantastic. <laughs> that isn't fair. And when we learn how to do this properly, to actually both give encouragement and demands out of your own abilities, everyone can achieve a lot more than they ever thought or felt possible. For me, my life actually started with me being completely paralyzed. I couldn't even move. I was six months old when I learned how to actually move my head three, four centimeters to the left and right. I was about six months. My, the, the doctors then told my parents that this child will never ever be able to move. He won't probably ever be able to sit up by himself. I was two years old when I sat by myself. I was six years old when I learned how to sit up if I was lying down. Then I started rocking, like an old rocking chair, you know what I mean? L further and further every time. And after about 25 rocks, I was able to sit up. <laughs> I lost five minutes of my life doing it every time, but <laughs> it worked. I was six when it worked. When I was 12 years old when I learned how to do a sit up for the first time. And before the Paralympic Games in Sydney, I, without a problem, did about 400 sit ups, straight up. Imagine what would happen if I was 10 years old, trying to do my first sit-up, if my coach had told me, this is good, David, but there's another guy, same disability as you, he does 400 sit-ups, keep practicing. I would retire. <laughs> I wouldn't go there again. It would be too hard, too far away. And this is actually what all our children see every day when they watch the regular Olympics. They see athletes that are so good that it's impossible to reach. So we need to keep our role models, but we need to understand that they are role models and not compare, compare ourselves in everything that we do. I think that's extremely important. So training took a huge part of my life, a huge part. I actually started extremely early doing physiotherapy every day. I quickly changed to disabled sports because it was more fun. I did the same thing, but I did it in a more fun way. And I tried everything. When I was 12 years old, the World Championships for Disabled People in Swimming was held in my hometown in Gothenburg in Sweden. And I was there taking a look and I saw one guy, he was a quadruple amputee. He had no arms, no legs, amputeed by his shoulders and by his hips from Britain. He won the World Champion gold medal for people with the most severe disabilities in uh, Gothenburg. And I, had a, I, I couldn't swim. <laughs> He came up to us, sat down with us children who were there. He was 25, I was 12. He has a, had a world championship gold medal. I had a swim ring. <laughs> and he actually told me, if I can do this, so can you. And then it's hard to say, it's easy for you to say, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I actually felt that there were no excuses left. I, I just had to try it. So my goal when I started swimming was not to become a world champion or to compete. I wanted to learn how to swim. That took me about six months. And when I finally learned how to swim, it took me over two and a half minutes to do a 25 meter race. Before Sydney, 15 years later, I easily did 40 seconds on a, two and a, on a 25 meter race. So I was two minutes quicker, but it's still I get beaten by every 12 year old in Sweden without a disability, without any problem. 
but I compete against myself. I want to show you a quick part of one of my races in Sydney. It's not the full race, but it's a small part of the race. This is the end part of the race in Sydney, where I use only my legs to swim. I keep my strength up by actually working with my neck muscles all the time, not uh, to drown. <laughs> I do all strokes, freestyle, backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly. <laughs> I don't care much for butterfly. <laughs> you can understand that. They called me the dying swan <laughs> in the national team. I don't know why. Finishing, slamming my head into the wall. It hurts a bit, but it's the Paralympics. <laughs> it's only once every four years, so. But I want to show you one more thing. When I started swimming, I went to the swim pool 12 years old after I'd seen that guy without any arms and legs. And after one hour training to learn how to swim, my coach actually told me that we don't help people out of the pool here. You're supposed to learn how to do it by yourself. Okay, that was my reaction. So, but I trusted her. So I went up to the pool and I figured that if I could sort of go again with my back against the edge of the pool and try to lift my back head up onto the edge of the pool, hold on with my, my neck and my head onto the edge of the pool. St I couldn't even raise my legs slowly, but I thought I could maybe throw them up on the edge of the pool as well. So the, the thing was that I wanted to have my foot on the edge, my neck on the edge, and try to raise myself out of the pool with my, with my left thigh. That was my plan. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? I failed. <laughs> I failed every training session for over four years. She forced me every training session for over four years. Two, three, four times every training session. And every time I fell down. And after I tried, en tried enough, she lifted me out. Can you imagine how it felt when I actually got out of the pool for the first time, when I was 16 and a half? That felt better than any of my 14 world records, or my Paralympics, or anything like that. Because that was the biggest step that I made. And I believe that when we use terms like making the impossible possible, it's not about one man or woman anywhere, somewhere in the world that can achieve something we all can't. I don't, I don't even, no, I don't think that's interesting. Making the impossible possible is when we all practice, train, and learn something that we couldn't do before. Then we have made the impossible possible for us. And the day we start to actually focus on our abilities and our development that way, Will, that will make us enjoy the next step even more, because we feel like a win. Usually, standardly, competitions have been only in the Olympics. Even confidence. We have been getting confidence by comparing ourselves against everyone else. The more people we beat, the better we are. We've done that every time, every year, even since ancient Greece. That's the way we have been doing it. But today, we have a problem, because we don't only compare ourselves in sport. We compare ourselves to everyone else in life. We do it comparing ourselves in how thick we are, how thin we are, how tall we are, what kind of dr car we drive, what we work with, our clothes, what we wear. And I strongly believe that if we always try to get our value as human beings, as individuals, as persons, depending on how many people we beat, we will always lose. <laughs> And I hate losing. In order for me to win, I need to compete against myself. And when I start competing against myself, I win. So if it's more fun to win than lose, choose the right contest. You choose yourself. Choose the right competition where you become better instead of only always becoming the best. Only one in the world can become the best. And even him or her, what sh will she do next year? Becoming the best again? <laughs> it's more fun to become better. I will show you the, uh, how I came out of the pool. Actually, when I came to Sydney 15 years later, I realized that I was the only swimmer in the world in my class who could climb out of the pool myself, even in the Paralympics. Yeah. Everyone else needed help. I felt pretty cheated that day. <laughs> now, we, we, had a <laughs> we actually had a talk about lies and ethics. No, no. 
but I'm the only one who can do it. So since I'm the only one who can do it by myself, they put a blue mattress on the edge of the pool so the other ones won't injure the back when they are actually lifted out of the pool. I can't hold on with my feet on a mattress. So here, my coach gives me support in the hollow of my knee and I lift myself out. But usually I do it all by myself. This is the muscle I use to climb out of the car, to hop over into the bed. Climbing out, rocking up, hop into the wheelchair. I can actually get into the wheelchair myself as well, but that takes 15 minutes. So we had other swimmers waiting, so we do 50-50. Yeah, that's how it works. So you got a grip of that as well. We all need to succeed. We feel good when we win. We need to have right. We need to be right. Um, we need to have someone to dare to put or place demands on us. My coach actually dared to tell me to get out of the pool myself. When I started writing with my mouth in preschool, my teachers dared to tell me, you can do better, do it again, even if I did it with my mouth. I like to, there's a big difference between short-term kindness and long-term kindness. And I believe that demands, they are, that is long-term kindness. And that's a really important difference. And that's the mo most important thing that I learned is that I can achieve more than I ever thought possible. I can become good at something. Maybe I don't know what, but I need to actually accept my disabilities to find that, to see what I can become, become good at in life. And a lot of factors are actually affected by your attitude. The most common questions I get from journalists always is, isn't it hard with the high sidewalks to get up on them? And I always tell them the same thing. I don't care about high sidewalks. I look for the low ones. <laughs> That's where I can get up. <laughs> That's a big difference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.